If you're not familiar with uh, the book of Ruth, Ruth is found between Judges and Samuel. It's a tiny little sliver of a book. By Old Testament standards, there's not a whole lot to it. In my Bible, it's about four pages. Most Bibles, two or three pages. So if you're looking for it, it's way up towards the very front. And we're going to be, as I said, in Ruth chapter 3 pretty exclusively today. In fact, there's no other reference. So if you want to open your iPads, your iPhones, your Androids, your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3, that's where we'll be. If you're here and you don't have a good Bible, you'd like a Bible to read at home, there are some Bibles um, on the Welcome Center They are blue, they are paperback Bibles, they are ESV Bibles. You're welcome to take those. If those all disappear, I've got another 42 or so of them in my office that I'd like to give away. I purchased them so that we can give them away. And if you don't have a good reading Bible, take one. Take it home. Bring it to church with you. Use it for Bible study. Keep it in your car. Uh, Keep it somewhere where you're going to be able to read the Word of God. And, you know, sometimes... You know, if you've got a big old Bible like I do, like this one, this one's a study Bible. It's a fantastic Bible, but you'll get a hernia if you try to carry it everywhere, right? And this thing, this, this is a, you know, when you want to kill a bug, this is the book you grab. And it's, it's heavy. It's got some weight, right? Well, that's not always easy to carry with you. So if you want a, an easier to carry Bible, these uh, ESVs are paperback. They're quite light. Um, the end result of that means they're not going to be the most enduring Bibles, but that's okay. They were cheap. So, um, <laughs> We can live with short lifespan if they were inexpensive. Not a problem. Well, just quickly give you a recap of where we have been. Uh, We've been working our way through the book of Ruth, and we've got a couple more weeks here in the book of Ruth uh, to finish out, and then we will move on towards some more Easter-orientated specifically kind of things. But in Ruth 1, we learned that Elimelech, um, a man who had moved his wife Naomi and his two sons from Bethlehem to Moab in search of a better life. Now, the two sons get there, and then they find Moabite wives. Uh, The ladies' names are Ruth and Orpah. And then the story takes a turn for the worse very quickly, early on in the story, because all three of the men die, right? So this leaves Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah in a bind. Orpah, after a little discussion with Naomi, decides, you know what? I'm going to go back to my family. I'm going to go back to my people. I'm going to go back and hang out with the Moabites that I grew up with. So, so long, farewell, enjoyed the time we had, but we're through. Ruth, on the other hand, says, you know what? Um, I'm going to cling to Naomi. Naomi is this woman of tremendous character. She she is worthy of my working with her, and and I'm going to put my hope into Naomi, and I'm going to do what she does, to the point at which uh, Ruth pledges that. She says, I'm going to die where you die. She says, I'm I'm going to live where you live. I'm going to go where you go. Your God, Naomi, will be my God. And if I go back on any of this, may your God strike me dead. May the God of Israel kill me if I'm not true in this covenant that I'm making to you. So it's at the point then that Naomi and Ruth, they go back to Bethlehem uh, because they've heard, you know, kind of heard it through the grapevine. You remember that song, right? They've heard it through the grapevine that there's food has come back to Bethlehem. See, the family had originally moved because of a time of famine and drought. And so now things are going pretty well again back in Bethlehem. And the ladies say, well, let's, let's head back there. Naomi has some relatives there. There, there, there may be a hope of survival for them there. Now, throughout the whole first chapter of the book of Ruth, we are reminded by the author of the sovereignty of God, that, that God is in con- control, that, that God is in charge, and that, that throughout it, God is looking out for Naomi and Ruth. And in the very same vein, it's to remind us that God is looking out for us as well. <clears throat> and then we get to chapter 2, where we were last week. In chapter 2, we get this new important character introduced into the story, a man by the name of Boaz, right? Ruth goes out into the fields to glean, which was kind of the Old Testament version of the food shelf, right? Boaz, he kind of sees, there's a new lady out in my field. I've never seen her before. She's not one of my employees. She's not one of my servants. Boaz sees Ruth out in his fields, and he kind of takes an interest in her, right? And he tells his men, she is not to be touched, right? So basically he's going, dibs, right? That's what Boaz does. Did you do that when you were kids? Or, you know, or, 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 or if, if your family was really crazy, like you'd pick up a muffin and lick it so nobody else would eat it? You didn't do that? All right, whatever, you're all lying. 
But he basically says, guys, keep your hands off of her. She's not to be touched. And not only is she not to be touched, but he arranges for her to be taken care of, basically. He, he makes sure that his, his workers kind of leave a little extra behind for her, uh, gives her a little more than what might be otherwise required. See, the law required of a landowner, a Jewish landowner, that they would leave certain segments of their fields without uh, having been harvested. So the poor, the orphans, and the widows could go and do some work and gather some food and at least sustain themselves, have a sustenance level of living. But he kind of, he raises that bar and he says, you know, leave some extra. In fact, you know, kind of after you've gathered it, just kind of leave her a little pile and let her pick it up and let her have it and, and don't say anything to her about it, right? So, so Boaz ends up feeding Ruth. He gives her, he, he, he invites her to his table eventually, feeds her, and not only does he feed her, I mean, he's gone from feeding her in the fields to now feeding her in person, but then he like makes a takeout box and sends it home with her, right? So she takes some extra food home, um, and then on top of that, Boaz offers her what is effectively a steady job through the remainder of the harvest season. And then in the context of all that, as, as a reminder of God's sovereignty, near the very, very end of chapter 2, uh, the author, again, kind of drops into the story this, this beautiful little hint of God's sovereignty. Because at the very end of, of chapter 2, it's there then we find out, oh yeah, Boaz? Oh, Boaz is actually a, a, a relative of Naomi's, right? She married into a family that's re- related to Boaz. So there's actually some sort of relationship there. So then with that, um, that brings us to Ruth chapter 3. And if you haven't opened your Bible or your Bible app, do so and we'll get started. I'm going to say just a quick prayer so we can get going. So pray with me real quick. Father God, we just pray that you would bless this time that we have together. Bless this message. May you send your Holy Spirit down to anoint my words today and the ears of all who listen. This is a beautiful story you have given us, Lord. May it inspire us and may it strengthen us and encourage us that we might go and do your will into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, well then let's dig in, starting right away. Ruth 3, chapter 3, verse 1. Um, we start with uh, Naomi talking to Ruth, and it says, basically here's what it says. It says, one day Naomi was talking with her mother-in-law, and she said to her, my daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Now, you see, up to this point, Ruth has basically been taking care of Naomi in this story, right? Naomi has kind of faded into the background at this point in the story a little bit. But now, Naomi again becomes an active player in the story. And as I mentioned last week, this is beginning to really turn into a love story. I even sang, right? Love is in the air, right? I'll spare you for two weeks. Um, but, but the story last week ended with Ruth out in Boaz's fields for the duration of the harvest. And then, just as it is today, the harvest took some time, right? I mean, harvest doesn't occur overnight. It it takes a while. And so the story actually tells us that this was two harvests, in fact, and not just one harvest. It was a, a, a barley harvest initially, but then it transitions into the wheat harvest as well. So in all likelihood, we see in the story that Ruth has been out working in Boaz's fields for six, maybe eight weeks. I mean, we're talking a couple of months at this point where chapter two ends and chapter three begins. Um, One thing that we should always be mindful of as we're reading through scripture is that the authors of the Bible, they they emphasize or they de-emphasize things um, with time. They'll they'll speed up the storyline and they'll slow down the storyline. And so the original readers of this story, or listeners, as was more the case at the time, um, as they would have heard this and read this, they would have inherently known the length of these things that were going on. They would have known, you know, how long roughly the harvest takes, and and they would have understood that. They would have understood the the custom of gleaning and, and what that meant to go out in the fields. They would have understood, you know, the idea behind the drawing of water that we talked about before, and and how the person with the lowest social status would be the one who had to draw the water, but instead Boaz says, no, 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 that's not for you, Ruth. Somebody else will do that. You just go get drink some of the water and be blessed. And so Boaz gives her some social standing. And, and all those things kind of would have come to those early listeners that we kind of have to dig in a little bit. And it's good for us to dig into these stories because 
when we examine these passages closely, uh, they begin to come alive to us. I, I've mentioned this the very first week. The, the story of Ruth is beautiful literature. Uh, it uses irony well and all sorts of other forms of literature, and, and it comes together and, and makes for a, a beautiful, beautiful story. And as often as not um, in a story, the time passage is an important portion of what's going on. And in addition to that, what is left unsaid is sometimes as important as what is said. And we saw last week, Boaz had started to show some interest, right? And then we get to this harvest season and it goes six, maybe eight weeks. And as far as the Bible's concerned, nothing's really happened, right? So ladies, if a guy was like, Hey, lady, how you doing? He starts showing some interest, and then he doesn't call for six or eight weeks. Right? You're like, what's up with that? And, and so Ruth is, you know, she's not exactly sure what's going on, but we know in the storyline nothing more has happened. I mean, yes, Boaz is still providing for her. Ruth is still being protected, But for whatever reason, and we don't know why, Boaz has failed to take the next step. Maybe he's just too busy at the office counting soybeans or something. I don't know. But he hasn't closed the deal. And every day, Ruth faithfully has to go to the fields. She's out working hard, right? Every day, Ruth gets to the fields. She's working in the sun. I mean, this is a Mediterranean climate. She's out working hard, hardworking gal. And every day, she sees Boaz go riding by in his F-350 chariot, right? Riding by, riding by, wondering, did he forget about me? Right? Ladies, how would this make you feel? He never calls. He said he's interested, Right? You get the picture. Now, Ruth is somewhat limited by the social norms here as to what is allowable for her to do. She can't just outright pursue Boaz. And, and, and that's, that's a simple standard of that society. But on top of that, she's a Moabite lady. And that carries some baggage, as we've talked about before. She was poor. She was widowed. She's no longer a virgin, and and she's at the lowest level of society. She likely really didn't get a chance every day to look her best, right? You imagine, I mean, if you, some of you I know have done this. If you've ever, like, thrown hay bales and worked out in the fields, right? You know what that's like. Hot, dusty, bugs biting you. You got all kinds of welts and dirt in your eyes, and it's caked on, right? And this is before the time and the advent of hot water heaters and showers, right? And, and, and remember, Ruth is poor. She probably has one change of clothes, maybe two, but probably one good set that you wouldn't wear for most things and one set you wear every day to go to work in, right? So Ruth has got to be wondering, uh, what's going on? Is it me? Did I do something? Does my butt look big in this robe? I mean, what, Right? And so Naomi becomes active in the story again. You can laugh. It's a joke. It's okay. Church should be fun. So Naomi decides to get involved in the story again. And and she decides to help Ruth make a play for Boaz. That brings us to verse 2. Verse 2 says, Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you've been serving, a kinsman of ours? Okay, this is a a form of speech we don't normally use in English, but both Ruth and Naomi obviously know that Boaz is Naomi's relative. It's kind of like a rhetorical question of sorts. And Naomi is, is just reminding Ruth of that connection, setting the stage for Naomi's plan. Continuing with verse 2, she says, Tonight, Boaz is going to be out winnowing the barley on the threshing floor. Wash yourself, Ruth. Perfume yourself, you know? Destinkify yourself. Put on your best clothes, she says. Ruth, Boaz is going to be wrapping things up from the harvest. He's going to be separating the seeds from the shaft on the, on the threshing floor, right? He's going to be working hard, and we need to make our move now. Here's what you're going to do. Go get a mani-pedi. Go to the salon. Get your hair done, right? 
Get some of that Chanel. Spray it on. Get your good going to church clothes on. Right? Get out your best dress. Put it on. Maybe some lipstick or whatever it is they got. Put it on. And then, here's the deal. See, Naomi knows that Boaz has shown a little bit of interest in, in, in Ruth, right? But where has Boaz always seen Ruth? In the fields. He's never seen her done up. He's only seen her in the stinky, sweaty, pitted out dress that she's working, collecting, gathering dust. She's, you know, all the bug bites I was talking about, just the grossness that comes with working in a field. I mean, what do you fertilize fields with? Yeah, and she's out there walking in it, right? Every day. Okay, let's be real. We live in a farm area, we understand this. And if you're out there working in that every single day, it's tough to look good, right? It's blazing hot, deodorant hasn't yet been invented. Okay, are you getting the picture? And like I said, she's poor, she doesn't have a bunch of changes of clothes. So Boaz has not seen her at her finest, right? And Naomi says, Ruth, go get all gussied up. Let's see what we can do. More in verse 3 there. It says, then you're going you're gonna to go down to the threshing floor. But, but hey, Ruth, don't let him know that you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, in verse 4, she says, take note of the place that he is lying. Then go, uncover just his feet. Just uncover his feet and lie down. And then... He'll take it from there. He'll tell you what to do if he's paying any sort of attention at all, right? So, so Boaz is going to be celebrating the harvest tonight, she's saying. And we know from Ruth 1 that the famine in the land had been going on and, and was, was, was severe. Severe enough people chose to move to places like Moab. So I imagine Boaz is, is throwing a big old party, which would not be uncommon, a, a big celebration to rejoice and give thanks to God and to praise his workers who had worked so hard to bring in this bountiful harvest, right? Everyone had worked hard and God's blessing was back upon the land and upon his people. And, and it was good to, to celebrate and, and maybe even relax a little bit, right? So Naomi tells Ruth, go down there, wait till after the party, then you make your move, right? Let him have a couple of beers and burgers with the guys. Let him blow off a little bit of steam. Let the night wind down. And once everybody else goes home, wait for Boaz to go lay down. He's going to make his bed where he's got his grain. And before he blows out his lantern, take note of where he's at, right? And once he's asleep, quietly go in. Just lift the covers off of his tink- little twinkly toes, right? Off his feet. You ever been sleeping and like have the covers fall off your feet? Does it wake you up? Your feet get cold, right? So she rolls up his bedroll off of his toes. And then Naomi says, just lay there at his feet. See what he does. Take it from there. He'll tell you what's going to go on next. Ruth 3.5. I'll do whatever you say, Ruth said. So she went to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. I mean, isn't Ruth the best daughter-in-law ever? Right? When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of his grain pile. Ruth, it says, she approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and then she laid down. Verse 8. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned, and he discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he said. I am your servant Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are my king's kinsman redeemer. Can you picture this? She says, spread your garment over me, right? Ruth is making her move. She's saying, I'm yours if you want me. Here I am. She's saying, I am into you, Boaz, and I want to make this a permanent and exclusive kind of thing. Step up to the plate, Boaz. Here I am. I'm yours if you'll just ask me. 
Make me yours, hunk of hunk of burning love. Right? So Boaz replies in 310. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. And, and he says this. He says, this kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. See, Ruth, you haven't run after younger men. You haven't gone after those other guys, whether or not they were richer or poorer than me. You've not chased after those guys. And now, my daughter, he says, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. And although it is true that I am, I am your kin through Naomi, he says, that is true, but, but there is another kinsman redeemer who is more close in the line, who is responsible for you than I am. And he says, so there's a little work to be done here is what he's saying. He says, stay here for the night. Be safe. Don't go walking and wandering in the dark throughout Bethlehem. Be here and be safe. And then in the morning, in the morning, we will go and take care of this business, basically. In 13, it says, stay here for the night. And in the morning, if this other man wants to redeem you, then let him redeem you. Okay? He's had opportunity to this point, and he hasn't taken action, but it's still his opportunity. But if that other guy, if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. So lie here until the morning. I mean, who knows what Boaz was actually thinking and, and why he'd gone all through this harvest without pursuing Ruth any further. But we see here the interest is mutual, right? And he's taking action. Not only is he taking action, but he compliments her. He says, you are a woman of noble character, right? And then he offers a prayer for her. And he, he tells her, stay here for the night so you'll be safe. Those dark streets out there, not a place for a single lady to be wandering. So stay here where you'll be safe. And in the morning, we'll take care of this and make sure that you are set up for the rest of your life. I will take you, but I'm not first in line. And if that guy who's first in line won't take you, then you're mine. That's what he says. Now, I tell you what. I can just imagine this setting there on the threshing room floor, right? I mean, I, I remember the night that I asked my wife to marry me, right? And I remember my, uh, just the blood pressure in my veins, right? I, I can imagine what Boaz is feeling at this point. That, that night I got down on my knee and, and asked my wife to marry me, there was enough blood pressure I could have powered a tractor's hydraulics. I mean, it was, uh, right? Now I have no idea if Boaz slept the rest of the night, right, after that. So Boaz does say, though, legally, I'm not first in line, but I do want you. So let's take care of business in the morning. Let's make this official. Boaz, you see, had provided for her. He had blessed her. He had prayed for her. He'd given her a steady job. He'd given her income, given her food, given her protection, given her social standing, treated her with respect. And now he says, I'd like to close the deal. But he knows he's got to do it the right way. He is a man of honor, a man of good character. Ruth 3.14. So she lay at his feet until morning but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. 15, he says, he also said, bring me the shawl that you were wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. So basically makes the knapsack out of her shawl, fills it full of grain and sends her on her way. And he goes back into town, right? In coming in night to Boaz, Ruth hadn't done anything wrong, but Boaz realizes this is a small town, and in a small town, people talk, right? And if they see you going home from my place early in the morning, it's going to look a little shady. So she goes home at dawn, just as the stars and the moon are starting to go back to bed. But before she goes, he says, come here, darling. There's something I want to send home with you. And he fills that shawl full bursting full of barley. How romantic. <laughs> right? Man, if I could only woo ladies with just a bushel full of barley. 
<laughs> Times have changed. But that's what he does. He sends her home with this barley. And what this means is, I think, think two different things. First, he's saying, I'm committed to what we talked about last night, right? And second, I think by sending all of this home with her, I mean, this is a significant amount of barley. I think he knows that Naomi's working in the background, right? And he's sending home kind of a thank you gift to Naomi. He's saying, thanks for orchestrating this. Thanks for pushing this to make this happen, right? Because he'd kind of been dragging his feet for a while. And so he continues to bless both of these ladies. Now, just as Jesus takes us under his wings, right, and keeps his promises to us, so too is Boaz doing the same thing for Ruth. And that brings us to 3.16. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi, Naomi, she asked, how did it go, my daughter? Well, then she says, everything that happened. She says, she told Boaz, well, everything he had done for her. And then she added, and not only did he do all of this for me, Naomi, but, but look, he gave me six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed, right? Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, okay? For this man is not going to rest until he settles the matter today. Wait, my daughter, right? Wait. He's working on it, and he's not going to rest until he's got this all wrapped up. Wait. Oh, isn't waiting tough, right? Waiting's the hard part. I hate waiting. I want it now. Even if it's going to be resolved in a day, I can imagine Ruth going, oh, I just want to know now. But they got to wait. And like Ruth, you're also going to have to Wait. You're going to have to wait till next week to hear the rest of the story. This is how I get you to come back, right? Now, of course, you could cheat and read your Bibles. That's, you know, that's, that's okay. But don't tell the spoilers to everybody. It's like ruining a TV show. But I do have an assignment for you this week. As you leave today, as you go about your day, as you go about your week, I want you to think about redemption. Because that's the, the big part of this story, Redemption. Boaz is actively redeeming Ruth. Jesus has actively redeemed us. Who else in your life has redeemed you in some sort of way? Who else in your life has made that commitment to you? Well, first of all, thank them. Thank them for that impact that they've had on your life. But then... Also think, who are you redeeming? Or maybe who should you be redeeming? Is there someone that you could begin to take under your wing? Is there someone that you could begin to look after, to care for, to be a blessing to, to make a difference in their lives? Who is that person? Who could you be a blessing to? Think about it. If a name entered into your mind, start off with maybe a call or stop and knock on their door and see where God will lead. But find somebody to be a blessing to this week. Let's pray.